Hello everyone. I hope you're doing well in your circumstances and have great plans for its improvement. Thank you for coming. I'm very, very honored that you would come and listen to Homemaking Radio while you work at home. And today I have many things to talk about and I have the three sections which is your uh, preparation, homemaking and the people part. I know you're cheating and going scrolling all the way to the end to see what I say about people. Uh, I know that's your favorite part uh, but I don't want to deter from my script here so you're going to have to listen to the other two. So for the for the while I'm talking why don't we eliminate any need for the things out there in this world and just put away the notion that it's going to provide for you an education or entertainment or uh, some commercial product or a socialization because we have learned have we not in the last two years that that the powers that be can shut it all down and then we have to focus on the home and this is where you're going to learn to be um to to communicate and and to be mobile and to be healthy and um, to be spiritual and is the center the home is the center for all these things and uh, I think you if you will just focus on that for a while you'll discover that anything you need to do even ministry can be done from the home so what if all you know you can have a place to go where you have coffee or tea but if they shut it down then then you'll have to learn to do it at home and home should be somewhat like a an inn you know if you were to pay to go and stay at a very nice place an inn it there would never be a discouraging word there and it would be done up and cleaned up in such a way that the tension would not even be there uh, hopefully they wouldn't even have the television going and the current news we want to put all that aside for now and just listen as you work and get a few things done I will read a, a verse to you I'm trying to limit the amount that I read out of here so that you can remember it and uh, it's not going to be a, a scholarly approach I'm just going to give you a few dis- encouraging words so I'm going to start out where it says Cast all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. Now that's from uh, 1 Peter chapter 5, but it's also in the Psalms. Cast all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. And so I think it's really important to have some kind of a routine that takes, takes some of this anxiety away also. And I believe that preparation helps a lot because if you can bathe and dress it takes away some of the tension that your life might start out with I know some people say they get up in the morning and they no sooner do their feet touch the floor than they're starting to wake up feeling tense so that is how preparation comes in is that while you're bathing and while you're dressing relax a little bit and also preparation includes your appearance getting your hair fixed, getting yourself, just to look your best and uh, be your best, being your best. And uh, then your exercises, just a five, I always choose just a five minute, a five minute stretch that I can uh, view. But if I didn't have the computer and YouTube, I would probably remember enough to do a five minute stretch that helped. And in general, you know, people say we do everything from the front and we lean forward and we've got our keyboard and everything. But before even the internet, homemaking always was uh, that way. Everything you did was from the front and uh, you, you would lean over a lot, pick up things a lot. And so your exercises always have to be, you know, correcting that. And so you can choose exercises that are the opposite of, of that and uh, so they're very very beneficial and also help you help your mind uh, focus better 
And it's amazing how that's connected, isn't it? So today I would like to talk about how clothing can be a disguise. Now that doesn't sound, you think, oh goodness, I don't want to hide anything. I haven't got anything to hide. But as I was outside during my uh, Regency walk today and listening to a robin, I thought, what am I going to say about clothing? Because I was already dressed up. I go, I get dressed up for my walk. I get dressed up for my ex. I'm remain dressed up for my exercises. And I thought, what am I going to say about clothing and its purpose? It's hard to find something new every time I speak. But I had gone through the Bible. If you remember my very first videos that I had kind of had a series on clothing and how it was mentioned in the Bible. And one of the things was when Christ said, when you are fasting, do not put on a long face, but uh, wash yourselves and get dressed and put on clean clothes. You know, fasting was for many different purposes. It was for um, repentance and it was for when there was sorrow going on or when there were hard times or when there was something that uh, you were concerned about or you needed and so people would dress up in sackcloth and ashes and go around with a long face and um, he you can look at that up in Matthew as to what Jesus said about it and so this is a great thing you get dressed up and you forget uh, you don't want to let people know you're really not in the right frame of mind. You're really not in a great mood. You get dressed up and you disguise that. And you don't let on. And that's the way people of the past used to be. You remember seeing photographs maybe of uh, people standing in line for food in the Depression and they were dressed up. Because even if you were down and out or you had hit hard times, you tried to keep cheerful for other people. You didn't want to depress them. And uh, you didn't want to uh, discourage them. So you tried to, you know, if you're a mother and you have children around you, you don't want to tell them all the problems of the world. That's not good for them. You want them to have uh, their innocence, keep their innocence and their, as long as they can. You don't tell them that there's going to be a war and you don't tell them that we're in a war and you don't tell them that that their dad just um, lost his job and that there's no money and there's not going to be any food you don't tell them that you uh, try to keep a happy face and a happy attitude and you do the best you can and uh, so uh, because it is very important for their minds and their growth, their spiritual growth and their mental growth for them to have stability. And so when you dress up for the home, uh, I think it help, aids in the stability of the home. So if your mood is not good, your dressing up can help disguise that. You know, someone sent me a very interesting video of a royal family in the 1800s, uh, a wedding, and I believe it was Germany. And uh, it was so interesting to watch it all. There was a reception, and I watched that, and uh, it was very interesting. But the comments were the most revealing because someone wrote in that these people were comfortable in formal, clo formal, formal clothing. Uh, and today we have been programmed uh, that formal clothing is uncomfortable, and you shouldn't be comfortable in it. You shouldn't wear it. And that's how we got away from uh, more structured clothing uh, and that all clothing had to feel like uh, pajamas because otherwise it, it wasn't you couldn't wear it because it wasn't comfortable but that's not true we're comfortable in what we are used to so if you uh, if you dress your children in good clothing regular clothing that's well constructed they are only going to want to wear that because we are creatures of habit and and we will uh, and I remember Mr. S would never wear uh, the casual clothing that the men were starting to wear because he had already established himself wearing a button-down shirt and a, uh, and he did not like the casual clothing. And, uh, you know, he felt more comfortable in more constructed uh, 
formal clothing. And it didn't mean he wore a suit all the time, but uh, these people in this video, this commentator said she noticed they seemed to be comfortable in formal clothing. And so if you feel like getting dressed for your home is just uh, not casual enough, just get used to it. Just get used to wearing something uh, in your home. A dress, I prefer a dress. I'm a sewist and I can sew them. But I prefer them because they're one piece. They're a little more formal. I use the cotton fabrics and uh, they're comfortable for me. But everybody is different. I understand that. And I've often uh, suggested that you experiment. You be a scientist and you experiment. And approach one day in casual clothing that doesn't have any distinction or color or anything inspiring about it and then the next day wear a dress with an apron over it and see if your mood is better and so today I want to also talk about the actual uh, homemaking and I think that uh, homemaking is more than it's more than housekeeping because you could probably uh, hire anybody to sweep or wash dishes but when you do it, it is you're doing it out of love for your family, and you are putting an effort in it, and paying, being mindful of your things, being mindful of what is needed. If you don't do your own homemaking and housekeeping, then you might not be as mindful of what is needed, where it is put. I always disliked it when someone came over and wanted to help me because I couldn't find anything afterwards, and. I had to restrain myself from being too helpful with other people because I'd visit my mother-in-law and uh, want to help and uh, dry the dishes and put them away and then she couldn't find them. <laughs> so uh, if you pay attention to, to the work and you do it, then you know where everything is. And um, so our clothing uh, can signal a mood, it can hide a mood, and it's a great disguise, but it also is a great motivator, and it can create, it's a ministry in a way. It's a ministry, uh, because it ministers to others in a way that cheers them up or tells them uh, what your values are. Uh, maybe it tells them that you're focused on your home, or you're focused on caring for your family. Also, I think that it helps in your in the contentment. And so now let's go on to the home and homemaking. You should fill your dwelling with things that you like. It should be done in what the the things that you're the most comfortable with. I know we used to get our ideas from uh, catalogs and magazines back in the day, but uh, we observed that the homes that the, that we liked the best were with things that the uh, homemaker had put in there that she liked. And they weren't exactly um, store-bought. You know, they would have a, a knitted shawl on the back of a couch or they would have uh, handmade cushions or uh, they would uh, have a lot of homemaker type stuff that they made themselves for their home and on, and of course if you can't do any of that you can always purchase them or find them somewhere um, and I think that's what the cottage core look and the, the cottage uh, deck decor is all about is just having things there that you like that you're comfortable with that make you happy and make it seem like a comfortable place um, and I believe also that your home is your castle. And I looked up uh, the word castle. I was very curious about this. Castle, and uh, the original meaning of it was, surprisingly, a camp, a fort, a fortress, a cottage, or a hut. <laughs> so every home is a castle. And um, if you're having difficulty uh, walking through your your camp, your hut, your fort, your cottage, or your holiday trailer, uh, your travel trailer, whatever it is that you live in, then I would suggest that you uh, get, prepar get prepared, bathe and dress, 
make your list, have a serious cup of tea, go do a walk through through your home, maybe do a few stretch exercises because that helps you mentally. I never could understand the mental connection to exercise till I started doing them and I would choose a five minute exercise uh, on a video that I could follow along with and some of them I didn't really enjoy but then when I learned to do them in uh, with a with a spiritual attitude you know that I want to be the best for my home and uh, for a spiritual reason they had more mo- I had more motivation in it and so then you can focus better I feel now one of the things that I like to talk about when I come here is uh, wives and daughters and uh, the Jane Austen diet which I read uh, pieces from and also I have a Bible scripture I want to read and it was from 1 Peter chapter 5 casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you one of the biggest enemies of homemaking is anxiety some people wake up and as soon as their feet touch the floor they have they just have anxiety from that moment on and that's why it's really important to start your day out with prayer and if you're having difficulty in your home ask God to help you ask God to bless you and it says casting all your cares on him for he cares for you and see uh, what a difference that will make in your approach to it and see if you can also uh, beautify yourself and your home while you're at it sometimes people get discouraged because the way that they approach the home and homemaking is so mechanical it's always about cleaning or it's always about things being uh, a certain way and they forget about the beauty and they forget about the warmth of it and they forget about having uh, an appealing atmosphere Uh, you know we use our senses we use uh, you know the smell of something good that you make to eat or the uh, the sight of a well-prepared room or a nicely set table I don't even know if people are eating at the table anymore uh, but it might be fun to do that uh, at least once a day (laughs) and make sure you're all together uh, or once a week but I think a daily uh, habit of setting the table would be nice people are forgetting how to do that now remember too that homemaking is not just housekeeping Uh, it is making it a pleasant place and making it a comfortable place I want to read to you from the Jane Austen uh, diet by Brian Kozlowski and I found a little place here that that sounded very interesting about the outdoors And I wanted to encourage you to go outdoors because we're all uh, sheltered. We try to, uh, you know, cut off the natural air sometimes and that that can affect your mood at home. So I wanted to go through this because it's kind of like exercise. And it says here, happiness is only complete in Austin world if it comes with an attached garden to stroll through. Now, I'm sure that it isn't like a crop. You know, it's not like you're go- walking through your, your peas and carrots. Uh, it, a garden is considered uh, something where things grow, but it doesn't necessarily mean your vegetables. So I, I had to learn that because to us, a garden was huge. It was behind the house on the homestead a huge patch of strawberries huge patch of cabbage a huge pack of everything we would not be walking in it uh, because my mother uh, was very particular about this Uh, but a garden was something else and an entire park with its own river and 10 miles of winding wooded walks even better Elizabeth longed to explore its windings, a longing for nature shared by every healthy body from pride and prejudice to persuasion. Whether that's a walk around the shrubbery, a whiff of sea air, 
trying to find my stuff here. Uh, a sparkle of sunlight or a twinkle of stars on a clear night. Austin characters gulp it all down like an essential vitamin as much as part of a wholesome three meals a day. Well, that's interesting, isn't it? <laughs> I was trying to find my uh, basil that I brought here, and it seems to be that I put it somewhere else. I was going to do a little study on basil for you because I was going to show the ladies' class my basil that I had grown and uh, share with them uh, a herb and I like to do that and then I buy them each a little bottle of crushed whatever the herb is that I'm presenting and give that to them and uh, I do that because I've been trying to do uh, Bible herbs and uh, I see it right over there so but it says that uh, she lost in characters gulp it all down like an essential vitam vitamin uh, have you ever been do you ever remember being very young and just gulping the air, almost uh, drinking it and eat, or eating it because it was so good. In a world where simple breathing in fresh air is a pharmaceutical drug, where the more you languish indoors, the more everyone will strongly advise you to go out, where lolloping through muddy fields and looking almost wild is a good thing. In a word, Austin World is teeming with biophilia, the belief that our bodies, being part of nature, need frequent physical contacts with nature in order to thrive. And I can say that straight-faced, without wearing uh, dreadlocks or seeing Jupiter align with Mars, the best minds of ancient Greece believed in the health benefits of nature, and Austin believed it. I've personally experienced it, and science now confirms it. Like Fanny in Mansfield Park, all of us have a taste for nature imprinted on our DNA, a missing puzzle piece to physical and mental well-being found free of charge just outside our front doors. That's so true, isn't it? That's something that's free. I'd like you for your homeschool assignment today to go through your home and comment on everything that you do or have or can do that won't cause you to have to pay out a fee that's that's relatively nothing is free but you know that it won't cost you any extra money to do to have to enjoy that's free you can sing you can open the door and breathe fresh air um, you can create something our current uh, techno driven detachment from nature might give us more reasons to look up from our screens and remember Austin's insights but the fundamentals remain the same in Mansfield Park or modern suburbia our relationship with the environment to natural light earth air and darkness has always been vital to our relationship with better health anytime you get to where you can't sleep there are many things you can look to that maybe you're leaving out of your life. Anxiety is one of the things that uh, create sleeplessness. So remember to, with for every anxious thought you have, to turn to God in prayer. Also, want to read to you out of this uh, weather book because I had mentioned this to you, uh, Eric Sloan's weather book. Now because I didn't have time to go through every little thing with my children sometimes as they got older they would just use something like this as just extra reading material and I didn't get to see it or hear it because I was doing something with a younger child or doing some kind of housekeeping or getting a meal ready and so now I get to go through it and I read you this poem uh, called signs of rain and one of the lines was um, the hollow winds begin to blow and it had all these uh, it was a poem that showed all the things that happened just before it would rain and it also might explain some of this eerie feeling you get in your own house once in a while uh, I don't know if I'm going to have time to read all the explanations but every line has an explanation 
So I'll just read it to you real quickly. I read it to you last time, but now I have the book. The hollow winds begin to blow. The clouds look black. The glass is low. The soot falls down. The spaniels sleep, and spiders from their cobwebs peep. Last night the sun went pale to bed. The moon in halos hid her head. The walls are damp. The ditches smell. Closed is the pink-eyed pimpernel. Hark how the chairs and tables crack. Old Betty's nerves are on the rack. Loud quacks the duck, the peacocks cry. The distant hills are seeming nigh. Low o'er the grass the swallow wings. The cricket, too, how sharp he sings. Through the clear stream the fishes rise and nimbly catch incautious flies. The glowworms, numerous and light, illumined the dewy dell last night. And see yon rooks how odd their flight. They imitate the gliding kite. They seem participate to fall, as if they felt the piercing ball. And truly, surely will rain. I see with sorrow our jaunt must be put off tomorrow. Now, there was a little section in here as to what each thing stood for. All these signs can be sensed and observed before a rainfall. And although the poet did not know the scientific explanation of them, he recognized them as reputable weather signs. Let's take a look at the old rhyme. Uh, let's take it apart and meteorology line by line and find the reasons behind its accuracy. Now, of course, one of the reasons that people have anxiety and is, are so uh, uncomfortable or uneasy at times, even in their own homes, is that we have not learned, the like Jesus said, to uh, understand life around us because it's all interpreted for us by the weather reports, by the news reports, by the educational establishment, by uh, uh, social things, uh, by entertainment, by uh, the commercial world. Uh, it, it's all over the place. Uh, our understanding of life is all in that. And we, we haven't had time to really uh, see and understand uh, the air and life. And so here it is. Let's take these old, this old rhyme apart, line by line, and find the reasons behind its accuracy. The hollow winds begin to blow refers to the hollowness of sound before a rain. This can be noticed particularly with boat horns, the droning of planes, the hoot of train whistles, all which seem unusually clear as if sounded down a long corridor. This happens when the cloud ceiling and bad weather inversion lower to earth, the sounds then echoing back against the sounding board of the heavens. In fair weather, sound radiates outward and dissipates into clear space. This would take a while to concentrate on and to think about and assimilate in my brain, but I find it quite interesting. I don't know when this old poem was written, but... The clouds look black, the glass is low. Okay, the first one was the hollow winds begin to blow. That was what he's describing as we begin to hear things in a, in a hollow a hollow sound and we hear sounds in a different way. And I hear the uh, whistling through the door here. Um, and then, and then uh, the clouds look black black this glass is low is elementary dark clouds are dark because they hold more precipitation and because they reflect the darkness of a dull colored earth rather than refracting the light of the sun as the ceiling of a weather front moves in the glass meaning the barometer will be discussed fully later okay the soot falls down indicates a lowering of air pressure. Delicate soot is often kept in place within the chimney simply by the high pressure of good weather air. When the atmospheric pressure lowers, the soot becomes heavy with humidity and chunks frequently fall into the fireplace below. So, last night the sun went pale to bed. That's a line that has always been commented upon in the explanation of Christ's words. I think that was referring to when he told uh, the Pharisees, 
you uh you can uh you, you think you can read the weather you can read the weather but you can't discern what's really going on in life you can't discern the sign of the times uh, the moon in halos hid her head means that a mass of rain bringing warm air has flowed in overhead causing ice crystals cloud form when the sun or moon shines through ice crystal clouds a halo results well, that is very interesting. People see strange things outside sometimes, and they think that they're uh, some kind of paranormal stuff. But people in the olden days knew what it meant, and they understood the weather. Now, I'm also going to read to you out of Cottage Core. I've told you about this book before, and uh, told you I thought you could all write one of your own. And this one is... Uh, about air purifiers in the house. If you're having trouble with uh, a creepy feeling or creepy house syndrome, there are probably a lot of things you could correct. First of all, I think um, getting things in order help. Cleaning something helps. Uh, airing your house out, opening the windows helps. Also, to turn off any media, that's not going to help at all. Um, it helps just to turn off the media and you start singing or humming <laughs> or uh, listening to someone else talk to you and uh, so here's a something some of you are going into winter so but this is also for all of you who are in spring in winter you may not get as many opportunities to get out in nature so bring greenery into your home instead many houseplants are amazing purifiers for indoor environments they cleanse the air in your home by filtering out harmful toxins and pollutants. According to a study, the following plants are the best air filtering ones to buy. Have at least one plant per 100 square feet of home office or, or office space. Home or office space. So let me just read to you the names of some of these. Now I've been growing some of my herbs in the house uh, just to see what that would be like. Aloe vera bamboo palm, banana palm, Boston fern, broadleaf lady palm, Chinese evergreen, um, elephant ear, English ivy, flamingo lily, florist daisy, uh, philodendron, and uh, peace lily. There are many others that are great air purifiers for the home. And now I'm going to read to you from Wives and Daughters here. And this is about the uh, made uh, Mr. Cox. And remember his father had sent him to work for Dr. Gibson. Um, and he was very proud of, uh, proud of his son. And he uh, wanted him to do more, you know, and to kind of rise up. Uh, in his life through Mr. Gibson's uh, office and uh, so I wanted to read uh, read a little bit about him and this is where Mr. Cox young man gives uh, wants to give Molly a note and I find this really interesting, and probably homeschoolers would understand this the best. We want to know what's going on in our in our children's lives. We we don't want them uh, making friends that we don't know about or having any uh, having secret communications with people. We want to monitor them as long as we can, and just to, so they will be safe, and uh, so that things will be appropriate, and that things aren't going on behind our backs that uh, would steer them away spiritually or harm them in some emotional way too so we want to be careful about that and we want everything to be on the up and up and you remember Mr. Gibson in the movie said if you had come to me first and told me of your interest in my daughter things would have been a lot different but because you tried to sneak the note through the maid and and to my daughter you know I'm going to have to have you dismissed <laughs> so Uh, I will read this to you here.
One day, for some reason or other, Mr. Gibson came home unexpectedly. He was on his rounds, and he had uh, three or four young men that worked in his uh, his office uh, filling prescriptions. He was crossing the hall, having come in by the garden door. The garden communicated with the stable yard where he had left his horse. That's an interesting choice of words. The garden communicated with the stable yard where he had left his horse. We probably would say connected. When the kitchen door opened and the girl who was underling in the establishment, she was a, a, an undermaid, under the main maid, came quickly into the hall with a note in her hand and made as if she was taking it upstairs. But on seeing her master, she gave a little start and turned back as if to hide herself in the kitchen. That would be a telltale act, wouldn't it? To start off somewhere and then you notice someone that's there and so you turn around and change your mind. Very strange. If she had not made this movement so conscious of guilt, Mr. Gibson, who was anything but suspicious, would never have even taken notice of her. As it was, he stepped forward quickly, opened the kitchen door, and called out Bertha so sharply that she could not delay coming forward. "'Give me that note,' he said. She hesitated a little. "'It's for Miss Molly,' she stammered out. "'Give it to me,' he repeated more quickly than before. She looked as if she would cry but still she kept the note tightly held behind her back. He said, as I was to give it to, into her own hands, and I promised as I would, faithful. Good, go and find Miss Molly. Tell her to come here at once. He fixed Bertha with his eyes. It was of no use trying to escape. She might have thrown it into the fire, but she had not presence of mind enough. She stood immovable, only her eyes looked away rather than encounter her master's steady gaze. "'Molly, my dear, Papa, I didn't know you were home,' said innocent, wandering Molly. "'Bertha, keep your word. Here is Miss Molly. Give her the note.' "'Indeed, Miss, I couldn't help it.' Molly took the note, but before she could even open it, her father said, "'That's all, my dear. You needn't read it. Give it to me. Tell those who sent you, Bertha, that all the letters for Miss Molly—' must now pass through my hands. Now be off with you, and go back to where you came from. Papa, I shall make you tell me who my correspondent is. We'll see about that by and by, he said. She went a little reluctantly, um, ungratified curiosity, upstairs to Miss Eyre, who was still her daily companion, if not her governess. It turned into an empty dining room, he turned into an empty dining room, shut the door, broke the seal of the note, and began to read it. It was from Mr. Cox, who professed himself unable to go on seeing her day after day without speaking to her, he called it. Um, Mr. Gibson finished reading it and began to think about it in his own mind. Who would have thought the lad had been so poetical? But to be sure... There's a Shakespeare in the surgery library. I'll take it away and put Johnson's dictionary there instead. One comfort is the conviction of her perfect innocence, ignorance. I would rather say, for it's easy to see the first confession of his love, as he calls it. But it's an awful worry to begin so early. Why, she's only just seventeen. Not seventeen yet, till July. Not for six weeks yet. Sixteen and three quarters. Why, she's still a baby. To be sure, poor Jenny was not so old, and how I did love her. Mrs. Gibson's name was Mary, so he must have been referring to someone else. Then his thoughts wandered back to other days, though he still held the note open in his hand. By and by his eyes fell upon it, and his mind came back to bear upon the present time. I'll not be real hard on him. I'll give him a hint. He's quite as sharp enough to take it. Poor laddie, if I send him away which would be the wisest course, I do believe he's got no home to go to. <laughs> After a little more consideration in the same strain, Mr. Gibson went and sat down at the writing table and wrote the following formula, Master Cox. And he gave him a formula, and uh, it was a dose of good character. Mr. Gibson smiled a little sadly as he reread his words. And uh, so it, the, this chapter describes how he went and gave him this note 
uh, for a prescription, but prescription was for you to behave yourself more diligently. And uh, he lectured him, and he said, from now on, all notes have to go through me. And Mr. Cox, of course, didn't like that. He was a young man. He said, if you'd been a gentleman, you wouldn't have read, read my note. And uh, But Mr. Gibson was reacting this first time this ever happened to him and uh, probably had never informed his daughter what to do if someone had sent you a note like that. I think it's really important to alert our children to things that could happen, and especially on the web. Uh, maybe you have a very nice family. They've never given you any trouble. And so you let them look up subjects on the web and their religious subjects, but they can get themselves in a lot of religious trouble and a lot of false teaching on there. So they may make sure that they consult with their parents uh, about everything that they learn and the Bible, of course. Now, there is one more thing I'd like to talk to you about before I go today, and that is ministry. Now, I've told you from the beginning, your, uh, your dressing, your appearance can be a ministry. Your homemaking can be a ministry. Uh, I once uh, sectioned off six subjects for my family uh, as I was homeschooling them because I wanted uh, to find out what we could do in the home that would be a ministry. Uh, homemaking, it's not just housekeeping, it's a ministry. Uh, feminine dress for the girls and proper dress for the boys, that's a ministry. Uh, hospitality is a ministry and in the home there are many things you can do for hospitality it includes letter writing that was another thing because that's also a type of hospitality and uh, tea time is a ministry letter writing is a ministry uh, you know sending something to someone is a ministry um, art literature and music and it's all part of developing ourselves in um, to glorify God and so I wanted to show you how you could bring out the best in people through those ministries and that's pretty much what I'm doing with these videos but there is a problem of belonging to a ministry that takes you away from your home and sometimes puts more burden on you as it takes more time and uh, I wanted to warn you about that because you could ask yourself some questions such as is there something in this ministry that could be better accomplished from my home or in my home or directly to the person sometimes if you join uh, a ministry somebody else is taking care of the organization of it and you get assigned certain things that maybe don't even put you in touch with the actual person you know that you're going to show charity to and this is what I like to do is the church uh, uses the contribution money for charities and things that they uh, have agreed upon and uh, but then we're always encouraged to have a personal charity where we help someone else and what I like to do is what a lot of the members of the church do is they just keep a little bit of their time and money aside or their talents aside to be able to at any time provide uh, some kind of charity for someone someone will call me and say uh, can I come over uh, just for a cup of tea okay so I have that ready I have this perched and ready it's all ready and uh, they can get themselves a cup of tea and uh, that's that's my ministry it did didn't cost very much and but it doesn't take time away from my home and uh, the only time that 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 would bother me is if um, is if I was already doing something else or was pressed for time and uh, so these uh, charities and ministries away from the home is there some way that you could maybe use decide to help someone uh, you know you can always get a list of people that need help uh, that you could help someone personally and that way you can determine how much time you're going to spend on it you could determine how much money you're going to spend on it you could determine because sometimes in uh, organized ministries or organized charities you don't actually get to the spiritual um, needs of a, of a certain individual that you would in your own home having tea with them or showing some kind of hospitality to them through a, maybe a card ministry, sending a card, or personal, you know, having a personal contact with them. 
And sometimes you have to be very careful of ministries because they actually really aren't about the home. We need to encourage the people we're ministering to to be homemakers. And uh, the person that we're, that we're helping, we need to encourage them. Uh, we want to help them physically, yes, but we also want to help them to um, find, a, find their own way at home and to create a stable home for themselves. And uh, so I would say... Uh, that you can probably do a lot of things. We found out these last two years that people did a lot of things from their own home and uh, people's homes improved because they had more time and they didn't have to go somewhere else to accomplish uh, everything. You know, you look at all the things we have to do that's somewhere else. Uh, and the homemaker, you know, we, we wanted to be home, but for years I did not spend as much time as I wanted to at home because everything had to be done out there. We had to go and get our groceries and supplies. We had to do our, our shopping, and which was essential, you know, essential shopping for the home. Uh, a lot of times we took courses outside of the home, whether they were craft or sewing or, or any other kind of classes. That was away from home. Education was away from the, ho of the home. Um, and entertainment was away from the home. But now... You know, you can do anything you like at home. And even uh, religious activities, they're all away from the home. Well, we found out the last two years how much we can do at home and how valuable that home is. And so, ladies, so that you've got some time to think about this and, and uh, do some of the things that I have suggested, I might let you go a little early today from class. Uh, but let's discuss the people part, the part that you've been waiting for. And that is today I'm going to talk about keeping a polite distance from the people that can trouble you. And uh, I've been a preacher's wife for 50 years and um, only just now have kind of woken up to some of these things. I wondered sometimes why, uh, why some people were constantly focusing on other people or uh, didn't seem to have much to say until someone else said something and then they would immediately uh, contradict or immediately object. And these people, uh, I've discovered, not all of them are just troublemakers. They just don't know how to talk. They have never been trained how to speak. I don't think years of public education has helped in the manners department. I don't think it's helped uh, socially. And of course, they get in a people get in a church. They're just bringing in their culture, um, and don't realize sometimes that there are some things they can't do anymore, and they there's some things they can't say anymore uh, now that they're a Christian. And they bring in these uh, these habits. And one of them that I noticed over the years was there would be somebody that uh, wants to uh, create a problem just by talking back or arguing back in a rude way and maybe not even know that it's rude but they think they're making conversations or they think they're being interesting and uh, and that critical uh, thinking was in, was encouraged in the past it was uh, considered very smart you know very intelligent to uh, criticize everything or argue with everything it just showed that your mind was sharp and uh, but that isn't really very uh, comfortable for uh, some people to to have to be the subject of that if someone uh, tends to target them all the time and I've noticed that people that do that don't really have anything original themselves to say they wait until someone else says something and then they immediately um, grab hold of it and begin to argue and so there are several ways that this can be approached and one is to limit the words that come out of your mouth because they, you don't give them any material if you're quiet. The other thing is I've noticed that if it is a one-on-one -on -one, uh, visit or conversation or uh, socializing, if it's one-on-one, -on -one, it's not so bad. But if you get a third person in the mix or even more, uh, this person is very good at dividing they'll somebody will say something very innocent like we're having very nice weather today and they'll say no we're not 
And then the other person, if there's a third one, will have to agree or disagree. And then you have a little division going on. And some of these people are really good at that. They think that's what they have to do. Sometimes it's not devious or evil or anything. That's just, it's just careless way of talking. And I was going back thinking about how people used to talk, both men and women, when uh, they liked each other. People just liked each other. They liked being around each other. And I grew up on a homestead in Alaska. And when we had visitors, they'd come in and sit down and have coffee with my parents. And the conversation was not necessarily anything controversial, deep, political, or anything. They just enjoyed having human beings around. And so they would say, well, how are you? I haven't seen you. Did you have a good crop this year? Did you catch any fish? Uh, and, and none of this could be argumentative. None of this was argued with. And uh, what have you been doing? And uh, uh, they would find out maybe if there had been an automobile wreck at the on the highway somewhere, you know, back in the olden days. Or they would find out uh, about a place that burned down. But that would be the extent of it. And in those days, we didn't have the media, you know, around us. Uh, it was very rare to find even a newspaper. And uh, so all of us just provided news for each other, but it wasn't, uh, there was no agenda to it. There was no, um, we weren't, they weren't trying to push anything. It was just this nice conversation. And I used to listen to maybe two women talk sometimes. And they would say, uh, if they saw each other somewhere, they would say, well, how are you? Well, uh, are you going to be home later on? Or just in a, just a very, very casual, in, interesting um, talk about how each other was faring, how each other was doing. And um, just a kindness, just a kind, a sweetness. And do you remember maybe years ago when they had the old-fashioned telephone, somebody would call and they would want to know, how are you? Well, how's the weather been? Well, how's your husband? How is everything? And they enjoyed, they weren't digging for anything inter at all uh, that was like inter interfering or anything. It was normal conversation and that soothed each other. And the other person would say, fine, and how are you? Is everything okay with you? And uh, what have you, what have what have you been doing? And oh, um, I went to the library and I got a book and the book was about such and such. And, and all this conversation, which we look at, I think today is so trivial, it's not worth it. But this kind of conversation kept people balanced, kept them liking each other. There was a warmth in it, but it was always laced with this caring uh, thing. And, uh, and everyone else in your house is doing okay. And you remember, uh, Elizabeth and Darcy going for a walk at Pemberley and uh, he asked several times and, and your sister how is she you know that conversation was more like what our if you want to go watch that again or if I could find the book I could read it to you uh, next time maybe or there's this casual conversation uh, was very similar uh, and they might ask again you know maybe just to keep the conversation going. So ladies, I hope that you got something out of this and that you got something done while you were working. If you like, you can leave a comment, but I don't demand it because this is a different kind of, uh, this is a different kind of channel where it's something you can listen to while you get something done. And if you have to stop, if you feel you have to stop and make a comment, that's why I don't do a live stream. Um, it's so time consuming for other people. But if you'd like to, you can leave a comment. You can also, if you don't want to leave a comment, you can email me. My email is on the side there on the page on which I have posted this. And um, until I see you next time, I just hope and pray you have a wonderful day and you get things accomplished. You get your home the way you want it and uh, function in all those ways that I mentioned in the home. And just, if you'll do that, maybe someone else We'll do that in their home. And then you can invite each other back and forth or if you want to, if it's beneficial to you and your children and your family. And uh, I just thank you so much for letting me come into your home and uh, for coming into my home. And 
I will see you later in the meantime. Please don't be anxious. Don't listen to the media. Uh, we're going to beat them at their own game. We're the media. <laughs> and our news and leaving your comment where you say what all you did that's the news that we're going to share with each other that's important and it, and I think it's really good for new homemakers to come and read these comments about what all you got done while you were listening because then they can say oh this is what I can do this is what I can accomplish uh, in the home and this is what I should be doing during the day I was watching an interesting uh, young couple on YouTube and I forgotten what the name of the video was but she said uh, I've washed my linen curtains and I've done this and I've tried to make the home you know more cottagey and nice I can't wait till my husband comes home and sees what all I've done to make it more comfortable and I thought that was so sweet and uh, so keep your mind on Jesus Christ and remember the scripture that I read to you today and that was cast all your anxieties on him because he cares for you and there is a scripture that talks about how God wants us to test him to see if he will not pour out from the heavens a blessing that cannot can be contained so ask God for what you need and see if he will not bring it to you especially in uh, the area of the home so i'll talk to you later goodbye